Hello, welcome to The Incubator, a biology jobology podcast. My name is Will Olds, and I'm a scientific officer at Protein Tech, an antibody company based in Chicago. So what is this podcast? It's a professional development podcast for scientists focused on interviews with PhD holders in a variety of areas. The idea for this podcast started early on in graduate school. I love science, but I just knew the academic side was not for me. Even though 75% of PhD holders do not stay in academia, I struggled to find resources and what I could do. So I started this podcast to help those who, like me, have spent days thinking, what is out there? How do I meet people in these areas? What is it like to do consulting, government work, finance, etc.? Am I, and am I doomed to stay as a pot, postdoc forever? An incubator optimizes growth conditions, and the hope is that this podcast will help you grow and develop into a professional who's ready to take charge and change the world through science. We will be uploading podcasts on a monthly basis. Today, we are focusing on teaching. In the coming months, we'll tackle consulting, uh, government, finance, biotech, and big pharma as well. So without further ado, let's get our first guest. Our guest this month is Dr. Beth Luoma, who recently graduated from Yale University. She is a teacher of teachers at Yale University's Center for Teaching and Learning. Okay, Beth, what do you do now? What's a typical day? Sure. So uh, I am currently director of the Helmsley STEM Education Program at the Yale Center for Teaching and Learning. Um, my work basically has two buckets. Uh, it's from a grant coming from the Helmsley Charitable Trust. And the first bucket is focused on working with teaching postdocs. So uh, I manage a cohort of teaching postdocs, two in physics and two in math. And as part of a three-year program, they teach at Yale for their first year. They learn how to innovate introductory STEM courses. And then they go on to teach at our partner institutions. So they'll teach at University of Bridgeport and at Housatonic Community College in the coming years. So my role is really to coordinate and facilitate that process and also to guide them through weekly ref reflection meetings where they think about their teaching, they troubleshoot together, um, they ask really great pedagogical questions, uh, refer back to the literature in terms of what good educational research informs our practices. Um, so that's, that's one bucket of the grant that I, that I manage. The other half is a national program. It's the Summer Institutes. Um, they started uh, in 2004, uh, backed by national academies, and a number of, of national funders have been involved with the Summer Institutes over the course of time. So these are um, a few day long workshops for faculty development. They're held throughout the United States. And we currently have three that are funded by Helmsley, which is what I manage, and two that are funded by HHMI. And so the hat that I wear in that bucket of, of the grant is to think about how to best coordinate this, this national network. Um, we evaluate these programs to make sure that our faculty are actually walking away with good knowledge of scientific teaching. And by that we mean the ability to employ active learning in the classroom, the ability to be inclusive while teaching and to really consider diversity, and also to think about effective assessment. So how do we know that our students are actually learning what they're learning? Um, so taken together, I've really loved this job and that I'm able to function on the local level in terms of thinking about our teaching postdocs here at Yale, thinking about our teaching community here on this campus. I also function regionally in terms of how do we interface with our partner institutions, with the University of Bridgeport, and with Housatonic Community College. And then I also think nationally, what are the national STEM initiatives that are really driving the scene in terms of how do we improve our undergraduate STEM education so that students who are interested in science feel supported and encouraged and are actually learning the science that they need to learn to succeed in whatever career path they take. So how'd you get that job? How'd you end up here? That's great. So I did my PhD in cell biology at Yale. And uh, the motto I've been using now is the, the more I do at the CTL, or the Center for Teaching and Learning, the more I do at the CTL, I get sucked further and further into this realm. So um, I knew right from the start when I was looking for a graduate school that I wanted an environment that really cared about teaching, um, that had excellent resources, sound pedagogy, sound support for people who wanted to become teachers. And so when I did my grad school search, that's actually how I selected Yale versus the other schools to which I applied, was I learned of this teaching center, I learned of the support, I learned that my program would require me to teach at least two semesters, and that was really attractive to me. And so right from the start, I got involved with our uh, Certificate in College Teaching Preparation Program. 
uh, really give credit to Bill Rando, who's now at University of Chicago, for, for getting that going. Um, but that program allowed me to interface with other graduate students and postdocs who cared a lot about teaching, uh, to become trained in the fundamentals of teaching, so that included a four-week workshop, the fundamentals of teaching in the sciences, um, to think about the logistics, right? How do you grade? How do you write a syllabus? How do you effectively lecture? How do you effectively employ active learning activities within your classroom? And so I progressed through that program and really loved it. Um, and as a result, I knew I would become part of the team that put on that, that program for the campus community. And so I became one of the uh, McDougal Graduate Teaching Fellows. And so the grad, those are graduate students who facilitate that programming. So when you walk into a workshop, those workshops are team led by two graduate students. Um, and there's a really great dialogue that occurs because of that, because it's peer facilitation. Um, there's kind of an expert in the room, but there's kind of not. So there's a lot of great sharing that occurs. And so uh, I became one of the fellows. And then, as I said, the more I do at the CTL, the more I do. So um, my last year of graduate school, my fifth year, I became the coordinator of that group of fellows. There were a staff of 20. And so my other coordinator, uh, Sarah Ronis, and I worked together to really think creatively about the program that we're offering and serve as a resource for our fellows as they, they executed on that. And so when it came time to graduate, I had my eye on teaching all along. I'd also taught in the classroom. I taught an intro bio uh, cell biology class as well as an upper level lab. And uh, I knew I had to be doing something with education. I mean, research was, was good. Research was fine. You know, I was able to publish and everything like that. But my passion was really in teaching all along. And so I reached out to the executive director of our Center for Teaching and Learning, and uh, Jenny Frederick, and basically said, hey, are there any leadership opportunities on the horizon? I really love the work that I've done at the CTL so far. Where can I go from here? And amazingly enough, a few grants had just come in. So there are a few opportunities on the table, one of which being this program director position that I'm now in for the Helmsley STEM Education Program. So uh, it was a lot of hard work in terms of getting involved, um, doing the best I could to become a good teacher, and interfacing with the networking community here. But at the end of the day, it was also luck of timing of when I was headed out the door, that's when some grant money was coming in. So Beth, what's been the biggest challenge transitioning from an academic bench job to a uh, teaching and administrative role? Sure. Your day-to-day -day is entirely different. Um, and you know, I was so used to functioning at the bench of thinking about my bacterial cultures, uh, responding to the fact that you know my gel hadn't run as quickly as I wanted to, and now I need to really adjust my schedule and scramble, or the bacteria didn't grow, or whatever it may be. Um, I feel like the day-to-day -day culture of working in a lab is, is constantly scheduling out your experiments, making sure they overlap, making sure you're being as efficient with your time as possible, trying to cram in reading papers and, and writing and every all the other good things that we do as scientists. Um, but just a different mode of thinking, I think, in terms of how you organize your day. Um, so instead of thinking about pipetting and, and executing those experiments, um, how do I work most efficiently with others in terms of getting my team together in a room and making sure we're all on the same page to execute the tasks that we need to execute in order to support our various programming, whether it's our teaching postdocs or whether it's our national summer institute community. Um, so, but what I did learn about myself in graduate school, partially through working with the Center for Teaching and Learning as a fellow is that I really love tasks that I can grab onto and check off and complete within a short amount of time. So you've addressed this a little bit with your last answer, but I wondered if you could talk about the culture difference. I know that you're in the same institution, but now you're in a different box. Is the culture any different from previous and now? So I am surrounded every day by people who are incredibly passionate about teaching and learning and education, um, which may or may not be the case depending what uh, niche you're in within academia. Uh, if you're at a place that really values uh, research, you may find that there are people who put up a little bit more resistance to investing that much time in teaching. And that's just something we encounter in the academy. And so I think that that's very easily recognizable in terms of my day-to-day -day interactions uh, in terms of the culture that I'm seeing. 
is that I've, I've found my people, <laughs> if that makes sense. I, I found those people that light up when they think about teaching and, oh, how could we innovate this teaching practice and make it even better? And, and, and again, it's still, but it's still research-based. It's still evidence-based. It's, it's using that scientific thinking um, to ask questions about what is going to be the most effective for our students and how, and how do we employ that. Could you talk about the most rewarding and exciting parts of your job? I know that you mentioned that you've enjoyed working with a bunch of Beth Luomas. <laughs> oh, no, no, and they're not all just like me. We just had that common interest and in that we're all super nerdy about teaching, but that's the great thing, too, is the diversity that the people around me bring to the table and the varied experiences and, and how, what I'm able to learn from them as a result. Um, but, yeah, so my most rewarding... I really love the community that's formed with my cohort of teaching postdocs. So this was a brand new program. I could, you know, there was a lot that was already laid out in the grant, but there was a lot of room for creativity on my part in terms of how to actually execute the tasks that we promised that we would do. And so uh, the idea I come up with was to form a community among the cohorts through meeting weekly. And so I briefly talked about this before, but. Every week, uh, the four teaching postdocs and I meet for an hour. At the beginning of the year, I gave them all journals, and I asked them throughout the year to jot down some of their striking teaching experiences. And those can be successes, those can be failures, whatever it may be in, in terms of what's on their radar, what really matters to them in that week. And then we come together in the room and we share those. So what are the highlights of your teaching for the week? Um, what could you have done better? What, you know, what went really well? And it's amazing watching the progression of that type of community over the course of an academic year. You know, in the beginning, we can think a lot about logistics, right? Okay, when I lectured for 10 minutes, I realized I, I really lost the students. I should have stopped halfway through and asked another question, and maybe I would have caught that earlier that they were confused. But as time progressed, you, you think about you know, the emotional dimensions of teaching as well. I have a student who's really struggling, um, is dealing with some personal issues, and that, per that student decided to confide in me. You know, how, how do I respond to that? How do I make sure they're connected to the appropriate resources on campus? Uh, I have a student who I caught cheating. What do I do with this? How do I best approach it? Um, so, you know, these, I think we often don't think about this as students ourselves, uh, how our teachers are considering how best to respond to our needs in the classroom that aren't necessarily academic. So seeing that community form and seeing that safe space develop and know that I had some hand in facilitating the development of that safe space, that, that's been really rewarding for me, for sure. Journaling is such a great idea for increasing thoughtfulness and reflection. And when you're journaling, you're able to think much clearer in about how you can improve. So anyway, how are you developing yourself now? Yeah, I mean, and transitioning, as I've said, from one type of daily work to another, I mean, that alone has been a open door for my own growth and professional development. Um, I have really loved interfacing with faculty from throughout the United States in terms of thinking about our summer institute programming and how we're really training the next generation, the current faculty and also our future faculty, the next generation of faculty. Um, I think one thing that I've learned in terms of my own development is that in order to be good at my job, good at talking to people about teaching, I really love actively teaching myself at the same time. There's nothing better than when you're having a discussion about best practices in teaching than to be able to draw from your own example that happened last week or happened a few days before. And so this semester, um, in addition to functioning in this administrative role, I've also taught a scientific teaching course with Jenny Frederick, with my, my supervisor, as, long, as well as with Corey Cuchera, who's our associate director. And so the three of us together have taught this semester-long course on effective teaching practices for our graduate students and for our postdocs. And so I have that, that course in and of itself is a conversation about effective teaching. And then I can also come, take it to the next level. We always joke around that things become so meta, but I can think about my own teaching in that course. And also, I've been teaching an introductory zoology course at Southern Connecticut State University. So I'm able to draw from that experience. So what I've really loved in terms of my own growth is watching the different aspects of my day or of my week inform each other. So when I'm talking about teaching, I'm reflecting on my own teaching. 
um, that's really helped me, I think, in terms of holistically understanding my own trajectory of is, you know, my next job, my next position, whatever that entails. Is it administrative? Is it teaching? Is it some mix of both? So that, that's been very helpful to me. That's wonderful. I was wondering if you could talk about work-life balance. One thing I can say about the Center for Teaching and Learning is it is so supportive of its employees uh, in terms of having uh, a dedication to your work, but also a dedication to the responsibilities that you have outside of work. Uh, case in point being that you know I was teaching a night class because it was the passion, it was a hobby that I wanted to do. So having the flexibility to make sure I got to class on time at the end of the day you know, was built in. Um, also, uh, I am currently seven months pregnant. And so in terms of being in an environment in which that has been celebrated, that has been truly wonderful, uh, a culture that you know, nods when you're going off to go to your kid's baseball game. I, I know I'm in that environment, so that makes me feel really great moving forward. Um, but I'm a person that really likes to leave work at work as much as I can. So, you know, I'm here for the day. Let's put in as much effort as I possibly can. Let's be focused on the task at hand. And then at some point you also go home, and I feel it's only fair to your family and friends and whatever other obligations you have outside of work to also be able to dedicate that full time and commitment and attention. Um, I find that's something that's been easier to do in my current role as an administrator than maybe it might have been as a graduate student. Um, many of us know that research can feel all-consuming at times, so I think establishing those boundaries is, is really important to allow you to have that type of work-life balance. If there, if there is such a thing, it, it ebbs and flows over time. I was wondering if you could describe your relationship with your mentor and how, it's evo how it evolved over the course of your PhD. Sure. <laughs> so my uh, mentor in, uh, during my PhD was David Calderwood. So I worked on, on cell adhesion, which I loved because I, I nerded out about cell adhesion as an undergrad with Rob Bellin at Holy Cross. And then, <laughs> excuse me, fast forward, I was working on cell adhesion yet again during my PhD. Um, David was someone who I always felt comfortable talking with. And I think in thinking about your own a graduate career, you really need to find a mentor whom you can trust and whom you feel you can have open conversations with that allow you to discuss not only the research, but let's reflect back on the discussion we just had on work-life balance, but also on the other things that are happening in your life. Um, because obviously that impacts your ability to work and, and to do what you need to do in terms of your research. And so when I was looking for a lab that was very much on my radar, um, I wanted to not only think about the research, think about the projects, but I wanted to identify an advisor with whom I'd be comfortable and a group of colleagues with whom I'd also be comfortable and feel that I would grow intellectually because of that influence and also be supported personally. And so, um, so David definitely fit that for me in terms of um, just having that type of open door policy. Um, you know, when I was kind of interviewing for his lab to rotate in his lab, the first, one of the first things I said was, you know, I'm really interested in teaching. I'm really interested in education. Is that an issue? You know, kind of shrug like, oh, that's fine. <laughs> so, which is kind of David's mode of operation. Um, but that's what I needed. I didn't want anyone who was going to stand in the, in the way of what I knew would be my ultimate career trajectory. I know that you mentioned that you informed him during your interview, but um, later on, when you were more certain that you wanted to go into more teaching roles, how did he react and how did you approach him about it? Sure. I mean, I, I would highly recommend being honest with that up front. I think that made my trajectory a lot easier than it, I know it's been for, for many of my peers. Um, but no, and considering it, you know, later on that, that you know, education was where I wanted to be, I think David definitely kept that in mind and how we thought about uh, my research in terms of how we thought about my time to degree, in terms of how we thought about how many publications I should have before I graduate, still within the, you know, meeting the departmental requirements, of course. Um, so it was really helpful to have that on the table. Um, David was definitely, you know, he didn't know much about education or about teaching, and so he readily acknowledged that and said, this isn't kind of really my forte, so if you're able to go off and find the resources you need, you know, I'm not going to stand in your way, go do that. Um, which, 
for me, it could, could, was tough at times in that I've, I've always loved when, you know, a mentor or an advisor will come forth and be fully supportive of what you're doing um, and really push you like, yeah, go for that. But at the same time, I think that taught me a valuable lesson of, you know, I'm not, there's no problem with it that's been presented here. This is my own initiative and drive now that needs to take me in the direction that I need to go. I need to chart my own course. I don't necessarily have the resources I need in my immediate environment, so I'm going to go seek those out on campus. And I was fortunate to be on a campus that had those types of resources available. So when were you most discouraged about your career and what got you through it? Yeah, I think that was like years uh, two through four of grad school. <laughs> that was, those were the dark times. So, so um, yeah, I think one of the most challenging parts of grad school is getting so sucked into your research that maybe that's one of the few things that you think about and there's a hairy line that gets crossed that you can almost define your self-worth around around the research that you're doing and so I was you know I jumped around on a few different projects in in grad school and that middle part of grad school I was just on a project that just it wasn't working uh, the directions I was attempting to push it in it wasn't moving fast enough, it, it wasn't giving us the answers that we really needed. Um, you know, it's really a shame that the, the publishing world doesn't love negative results, because I have tons from those years that I could easily publish. But, um, so that was certainly a challenge, that was certainly a struggle, um, and I definitely spent time internalizing those failures, um, rather than thinking more holistically of, maybe this just isn't the right question, maybe this just isn't the right project, maybe we need to push in a new direction. So what got me through it was ultimately late in my fourth year, start of my fifth year, seeing a, my project from a different angle and that there was an aspect of it that was really interesting to me but had nothing to do with what the rest of the lab was doing. And so I went in and, and spoke with my advisor to talk about pursuing that new direction and he was hesitant at first because it wasn't what our lab studied, but he said, all right, well, give it a month and see where it goes. And, and sure enough, that was the project that took off. And that was the project that gave me my publications, and that was the project that allowed me to graduate within a year after. So, um, you know, the, it was in some ways maybe luck, but in some ways it was a lot owing myself to think a little bit more clear-headed about finding a new way out. Uh, finding a new direction that would actually bring me to success. And I think it's easy to get trapped in a space where you're so frustrated you don't see those new those new angles. But you have to get yourself to a place that you can think creatively. On a related note, could you talk about some mental health tips? Have a community. <laughs> that, is, that is the best thing you can do. Um, and I was really fortunate to have communities in so many different aspects of my life. So I could think about my lab mates. Um, there were times we would... <laughs> If David ever listened to this podcast, it's hilarious, but if, if David would know that there were times that I would hide with one of my lab mates in the microscope room because I was so upset, I, w I was crying, but I had that person I could go to or those people I could go to to confide in, those people who were postdocs, who were senior grad students who could say, I've been there, um, and I know what it's like, and this will get better. Um, that was what was happening within my environment in the lab, which... Um, Again, not everyone has that within their lab environment, and that's why I think it's so important to make sure you choose a working environment wherever you are that has people that you find supportive. Um, but also, besides the actual lab environment, thinking about uh, my church community, for instance. So uh, being at St. Thomas More, which is the Catholic chapel and center at Yale, I participated in a small church community that met weekly throughout all of grad school. So every week I had that group of peers to talk to, to reflect with, to pray with, it allowed me to recenter when times were going well, or when times weren't going as I might have liked them to, but also to celebrate when, when things were going well too. Um, and then, you know, we stand out too. I've, you know, my husband is, <laughs> is fantastic. I've been with him for almost 10 years now. And so having that person to go home to that is outside of science. Um, to have that distraction, to be able to talk about the things that were bothering me when they were bothering me, but to also have, um, you know, an ability to just not think about about the work at hand for a little bit, um, you know, and, and just countless circles of family and friends that are that are in the area here when I was in grad school. So that's that's the best mental health tip I can get is just surround yourself with people that support you. Um, because you'll be able to do the same for them and, and they'll be able to do the same for you. 
Would you talk about any issues that you've had with imposter syndrome? It's very common among recent PhDs. Sure. It's funny you mentioned that because sitting on my desk uh, on the shelf here is a book entitled The Secret Thoughts of Successful Women, Why Capable People Suffer from the Imposter Syndrome and How to Thrive in Spite of It. It's by Valerie Young, if anyone who's heard this wants to go check the book out. But it's prominently displayed on my shelf. Um, and of all the things that are sitting on my shelf right now, which include this awesome piece of glass artwork that my lab gave me with like this abstract view of cell adhesion and like, I don't know, my Holy Cross flag and a family picture and a plant and the, you know, there's all sorts of things on the shelf. That book is the thing that gets the most commentary coming into this office. Um, and I think it's because it creates a safe space to talk about these types of issues that absolutely impact scientists. And at least when we talk about imposter syndrome, we often think about how that, that impacts female scientists. Um, my friends and I were out to dinner last night, and we actually started talking about imposter syndrome because I was talking about the fact that I teach now and, and adjusting to being called Dr. Loma by my students uh, after receiving my PhD and, and what that experience felt like. Is that, is that really me? Am I, have I really learned enough to become a doctor? But um, you know, there comes a place that we really just need to, to, to own that, to, to own who we are. So. Um, just like how I think in grad school we can attribute our failures too much to ourselves when sometimes there are a lot of other factors that are outside of us, I think the, the reverse can happen and we can attribute our own successes too much to luck, uh, not take ownership of what we really have done to accomplish the things that, we, that we've accomplished and to, you know, what we have contributed to our current position and to our current state. So um, that's where, again, I think it's really helpful to have community um, in which I've had friends reflect back to me, like, do you realize how much you've done? Do you realize how much you've accomplished? It's like, oh, yeah, I guess, I guess you're, you're right on that. I, I, I have done a few things, and, and I appreciate that being you know, told back to me. But even you know, without dependence on another person to kind of find your own self-worth, you know, keeping that you know, that Word document or that journal or that CV or that list or whatever it is when you have those moments to reflect back and be like, let me, let me think about what got me here. And I'm, I'm going to realize that most of it was my own hard work and initiative. You know, I, I, I received, you know, I, I was offered this job at Yale, the Center for Teaching and Learning, because, um, you, know, I, you, know, some, you know, you might st step back and say, oh, it's because I knew someone, right? But I took the initiative to get involved at this teaching center to the extent that I did, to have the experiences that I had, and then to reach out at the end of the day to promote myself and say, I am ready for a leadership opportunity. What, what's out there? Um, so owning your, excesses, your successes, I think, is, is a great way to kind of counteract that, that feeling that we describe you know, pop culturally now as, as imposter syndrome. So what was the most valuable skill you learned in graduate school? I would say the ability to persevere. Uh, I, as I said, I learned in graduate school that I really thrive on tasks that I can complete and check off. But it's also good to have the experience of going through a long-term project that was really challenging and that you really had to stick through in order to get the job done. So that when I am on long-term projects, and many of the things that I do within my the, the grant that I manage are long-term, um, I'm able to see the big picture. And I think that's something I hadn't spent as much time with uh, prior to grad school. I mean, we, we've talked about this with my lab mates all the time. I mean, how often is it that you spend five years thinking about the same thing? <laughs> I mean, literally the same protein, the, the same thing. You haven't thought about anything else. Um, so being that engrossed in something that is at once so small um, is also huge. Uh, it can really impact how you approach other problems in the future. I was wondering what suggestions you have for those interested in university level teaching. Absolutely. Get involved as early as you can. As soon as you know that you're interested in teaching, do it in whatever capacity you can. So you may be a graduate student who has the opportunity to TA. Uh, you might be a postdoc who is now considering teaching and you haven't thought about it before and maybe you weren't required to teach in grad school and, and maybe your funding situation 
you need to be 100% research dedicated, and therefore you're like, how, how on earth can I experience university level teaching? Uh, and my answer to that is think creatively too. So um, you might consider, can I, can I guest lecture somewhere, right? Can I go to either at my university or at another regional university? Can I give one lecture? Just to see what it feels like to be in the classroom and, and own the room. Um, are there, is there a teaching center on my campus? Can I go to that programming and, again, surround myself with a community of teachers and learn from that community? Can I gain the expertise I need to maybe be able to go off on my own into the science education research and learn what the best practices are and then employ them in my classroom? Um, but the more you do, the better you get with teaching. And, and the, more you, the more you try to learn, the better you can teach, both in your discipline area, discipline area and also in teaching in general. Um, so if, if something you're interested in, just, just keep pushing. And if the opportunities aren't obviously there, definitely seek them out. Uh, they are there. They might just be a little hidden from your view. What do you wish someone had told you before you started grad school? I remember our now graduate school dean, Lynn Cooley, mentioning the best advice you could give a graduate student is to be OK with the indefiniteness, um, which someone did tell me before I started grad school. But I don't think I internalized that to the extent that I needed to. I think. Um, one of the biggest challenges of grad school, at least in the sciences as we're discussing it, is not knowing when grad school is going to end, is not knowing when you're going to have that breakthrough. And so it's coming, getting yourself to the place that you can be at peace with that the best that you can, um, to know that grad school may take longer than you expected, but it might not be any fault of your own. So to internalize the ability to work hard, but not to internalize all the failures. Um, because some of those failures, sure, it's you. You like I accidentally threw water on all my cells instead of my buffer, and they all exploded, and I, I ruined my experiment. That's a true story <laughs> one time. <laughs> but we, we do have human errors that are, that are built into the process. But sometimes there's a little bit of luck involved. Did you happen to end up on the project that was the right one? You know, as, as a graduate student, a lot of times you just take a project that already exists and you go with it. Well, you're really dependent on what's been there before you. So you, you do the best with what you have, but sometimes that might not be enough and you need to go in a new direction. So learning to really stick to, you know, I would tell someone going into grad school, you know, stick to what you've done that's gotten you here. The ability to work hard, the ability to use the tools around you to solve problems. But don't worry so much about internalizing all the failures that you're, you will encounter along the way. Know that there's another experiment, there's another angle to try to, to get you to where you need to be. What sort of encouragement can you give those who are feeling pretty down about science? One, I would ask yourself, do you want to do science? Because I think sometimes you can get trapped in the mindset, this is what I have to do. I have to be a scientific researcher. So one, find out, is the discouragement just because you're in a situation where the project you're working on isn't exactly panning out that, the way that you expected it to? Or is it because you truly actually don't really like science? And that's OK. It's OK. The idea is identifying and discerning what's right for you. That being said, you know one of the major initiatives of the grant that I manage is to increase the persistence of STEM students. So what we're trying to do is to influence higher, ed edu higher education such that the introductory STEM courses and, and obviously the, the upper level courses as well focus on creating an environment where students can succeed and can maybe handle discouragement a little bit better because they understand the scientific process earlier within their educational careers. To know that science, when you get to the graduate level and you're doing your own research, is not a cookbook lab. It's not a lab manual that, op that you open and it tells you steps 1 through 20 of exactly what to do, but rather you are there designing the question, thinking about a good hypothesis, thinking about how to design a well-controlled experiment, executing that experiment, and now analyzing the data. You know, that's, those are all things that our students really need to take ownership of earlier in their careers. And so I, I, it's somewhere in between of I encourage every person to think critically about whether they want to be in science. But that being said, coming from the other angle, I want to think about how can we make sure we are fostering an environment that promotes science for those who are willing to do it. 
Uh, we don't want to. There are plenty of there are plenty of brilliant people in the world who could be excellent scientists, but maybe they were discouraged too much at some point by some sort of external factor. Um, so yeah, maybe that maybe that's a better way of saying it. In that, I want people to think internally: Is this right for me? But I also externally want to make sure that individuals are protected from, you know, biases that exist or you know other other uh, roadblocks that they encounter. Um, that have to do with our educational system, that they're protected so they can make the decision for themselves and it's not because they were told this is the path you need to take or need to not take. Do you have any other thoughts that you'd like to share? Don't be afraid to be a nerd. <laughs> I think that, it, and it doesn't matter what you're going to nerd out about, right? If you're going to nerd out about science and be like, I am all into bench research, or you're going to nerd out about education, or you're going to say, I've spent years in academia, that's not doing it for me. I really want to go nerd out about consulting or about business or whatever it is. But just find that that piece of the world that gets you excited um, and run with it. Because those are where the doors are going to open just naturally. Because that's where you're pushing all your effort and that's where your passion will really drive you. All right, Beth. Thank you so much for your time. A big thank you to uh, Dr. Luoma for being our guest this month. One last word from our sponsor, uh, Protein Tech is offering a mentor award to postdocs who've played vital roles in developing scientists. The winner will receive $1,000 and a mentor care package courtesy of Protein Tech. Nominations are currently being collected and will end, and it will end on July 10th. The winner will be announced on August 10th. Go to the front page of ptglab.com, that's Peter Tom George, LarryAppleBob.com for the nomination form and more details. All right. Tune in next month for our, our next interview, and please raise us on iTunes. Signing off.